So today I'm going to um, take some of the um, some of the knowledge we gained um, from looking at uh, the the RAR payload example that we did earlier on in class, um, plus some of the analysis that we have done um, more recently in looking at that revolution backdoor uh, tool um, that we've been that kind of I've been hacking on throughout class and then adding code to it. Um, so I'm going to use a variation of the one that um, I actually provided um, for the, uh, um, you know, for the midterm assignment um, in this uh, lecture today. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, multi-stage document attacks. So um, the idea here is that the um, executable payload, you know, the backdoor part of this um, is going to be identical to what you've been dealing with. What we're going to change here is how the backdoor gets to the user. Uh, so instead of using a kind of very simple, I'd say a configuration level vulnerability, which is what we used with the RAR example, that's really what the vulnerability was there. Um, it didn't do anything to kind of break the tool. It just made use of a, uh, a configuration vulnerability within the tool. Um, we're going to go beyond that now, and we're actually going to work with um, uh, exploit tool against Acrobat Reader, um, and we're going to demonstrate how um, how basically the attack can be built um, using uh, Acrobat using an Acrobat document, a PDF, uh, to deliver um, that backdoor onto the user's system. So what I'll start with is I'll um, I'll walk through some steps to put this together, um, and then we'll start to bring in some other tools that we can use to try to uh, simulate the attack in the lab environment. <clears throat> so, um, to start this off, um, we're going to we're going to initially begin with using the Kali VM. And uh, what I've put on the website here is uh, some documentation that covers um, using uh, using Metasploit, but using it in a more advanced uh, manner. So, some of you. Uh, may remember some of the Metasploit examples that we did earlier that were using the command line tool. Uh, the command line tool is really just a front end um, to some, or, yeah, I should say the, the Metasploit console, the MSF console tool is actually just a front end that gives you very easy access and very uh, intuitive access um, to command line uh, standalone programs like this one that I've got highlighted, the MSF Venom tool, uh, for instance. I'm going to increase the font size on this. That hopefully more of you can see. So selecting this tool right here. Um, so what I'm going to start with is jump up here to the, this is my Kali VM. So I'm going to jump up here to this and then also um, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to just um, I'm going to I'm going to back this one down to that phase as well. So I'm just going to reset my... Um, so what I did over here on my Windows VM, um, and if you feel like jumping ahead, um, feel free to. Um, I had reverted uh, earlier this morning, I think, um, to the clean state here, which is the VM that I uh, set up early on in the class. Uh, this is for Windows, so all the way back to um, the original state, um, and then I configured the network for host-only networking again, uh, like we have been using. Uh, and then I installed Acrobat 10. Um, the Acrobat 10 link is actually right here. Um, <clears throat> there's a very specific version. There's about, I think, five or six different versions that work with this particular exploit. Um, uh, or I should say work with this particular kit. Um, so I was grabbing this one uh, just as an example. I think it's the earliest one. So anyone who wants to can feel free to um, jump and run and install that. Um, I'll also give some time later on while I'm talking uh, for anyone to install that in the background as well if you want to follow along. But basically um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to the Kali VM really quick. And uh, check here. And 
I'm just going to do this. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so what I have here is um, this uh, MSF Venom um, program. And um, I'm going to run through this really quickly, but um, because the point of the class isn't necessarily to get you completely familiar with Metasploit. I'm going to run through really quickly what it's doing. Um, you are free to explore further on your own. Um, but for instance, I can put this in here. And the first hit that comes up on Google is the Metasploit module for this that explains what it does. And uh, in a nutshell, what it does is <coughs> this is uh, ex this is a exploit payload that will uh, run code that ex or that downloads using any one of these three protocols a file that's hosted and then executes it. So the stuff we did manually, stuff that we had the uh, user do manually during one of the lab assignments uh, when you had to put together that little web page. Uh, this is going to basically do that in the background, and it's going to exploit Acrobat Reader and then make Acrobat Reader kind of silently do that in the background unbeknownst to the user. So, so generating these on the command line is relatively easy. Uh, what I can do is I can just kind of copy-paste um, and then I can run it. Uh, your Kali VM will work the same way, so it'll, it should be able to mimic exactly what I'm doing. Um, and then what you end up having is you end up having a file that is called payload.bin, which is a, basically a generic binary file. Um, one of the things that's probably useful to point out here, um, and it might help if I do this really quick, um, <clears throat> so that command line that I just pulled out. Uh, let me increase the font size over here too. Oops. So um, what this little option does here um, <clears throat> is that uh, because this is generating a binary payload. It can have any number of byte values. Um, so I took out a term that's useful, or an argument that's useful for telling it which byte values to avoid. Um, get into that a little bit later, but um, suffice it to say that um, in this case, we're trying to write a exploit that's gonna be encoded in JavaScript, and that'll be put inside of the PDF. Um, because for those of you who aren't aware, um, just like in Office macros, so Microsoft Office supports like that Visual Basic script that a lot of you are probably familiar with, right? So you see some heads nodding. Um, Acrobat Reader supports scripting language as well, but Acrobat Reader uses JavaScript instead of Visual Basic, right? <clears throat> so because it uses that, that means that um, code that may contain the null character in it uh, would show up as a end of string character in JavaScript snip snippets within um, PDF. Uh, so um, I add this little argument to tell the payload generator that when it's generating something that's going to be shoved inside of a JavaScript blob, um, not to use that character. And then it will figure out tricky ways. There's a million different, well, not a million, but there's like 20 different algorithms or something like that uh, that it goes through. Uh, what it does is it'll go, or 11, I guess. Um, it'll walk through each one of them, and then it will stop on the first one that's able to generate a payload meeting that criteria. So it's a Metasploit again, very complex tool. Hopefully, um, at some point, you all will get the opportunity to take the uh, um, exploitation course that they sometimes teach here. Um, if not, um, there's plenty of pen testing courses out there uh, that teach you all the details around that. Um, but anyway, the reason that I wanted to kind of walk through this was uh, I'm going to generate the payload without that little trickery because the trickery makes the assembly code very difficult to read. Um, and so now what I can do, and I'm just going to dump the disassembly of this 
Um, so it's not going to be pretty or anything like that. So what this does is it generates um, machine code um, that would basically represent the body of what you would typically see in one of those functions that we explored using Ghidra. Um, so, you know, some of you may be aware of this already, what's called shellcode. Um, others may not, but basically this tool gives uh, uh, Metasploit's uh, payload generator like this gives you the ability to generate a sequence of bytes that are a pre-compiled routine, almost like the, the body of a function, so without the two, without the preamble and the, um, and the return part of it. Um, <clears throat> that then you can hypothetically in, insert into um, the middle of the program. So those of you who remember where we patched the, lit, the long string of no-op, like character 90s, the NOP instructions, um, hypothetically you could insert uh, any, in, any machine code instructions that you want to, you know, that you fancy, right? Um, so with Metasploit, what I could do is I could generate a sequence of bytes like this, and then I could take a tool like Ali Debug. I could open up a DLL or something like that that has a lot of functions, and I could overwrite one of the functions with this right here, and it would just work. It's, that's what Metasploit does. Is it a, Its payload generator will design things like that that will just run. <clears throat> so um, because of that feature, it's very popular to use it as a payload generator for um, a lot of exploits. Um, in this case, the PDF exploit that we're going to explore. Um, so the PDF exploit that we're going to explore um, will take this code and then put it inside of a large JavaScript template that the author of the exploit, who's not myself, um, <clears throat> put together. And, uh, and it gives me the ability to use his exploit to break Acrobat Reader and then force Acrobat Reader to run whatever code that I decide that I want to pull out of Metasploit or even handwrite myself. Uh, inside of there. So, <clears throat> so what I did here was just generating the payload binary, and you can look at the binary right here. Um, and you can see it's just like 440 bytes, um, and that's really all it is. It's just a long list of machine instructions. Um, now I add this extra piece up here um, that adds a encoding, and here I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So for instance, this right here would have two, three null bytes on the end of it. So these um, zeros right here would basically show up as like byte value zero. Um, when I run this with the dash B option, what it does is it'll take a moment, but uh, is it'll generate one that says that it's not going to use those characters. The payload size ends up being slightly bigger. Um, and then if I look at it, you can see the code in here looks completely different than the last one, right? So the second line no longer has that I, I was like E8, 9 something, and then six zeros. Um, and actually, if you scan through all of this code, you'll never see the zeros. Now, one thing I'll say about this is that um, this uses some like really advanced assembly language that you probably won't even be able to learn at any one of the classes here. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll be honest, I struggle to make heads or tails of what any of this is. Um, but someone who spent um, days upon days upon days inside of an assembly language reference manual uh, figured out some creative trickery using the floating processor unit of the CPU to be able to make this whole um, unpacking scheme work. <clears throat> and then to everyone's benefit, we get a tool that allows us to encode our shell code in a um, kind of self-modifying bundle so what it'll actually do is it'll unpack itself in place. So somewhere down here, um, I will be totally honest, I don't know exactly where, but somewhere down here is actually what is encoded bytes. 
when this runs, it'll actually unpack those in real time in memory. Um, and then once they're all unpacked, it'll jump to that code and then continue running it. So um, anyhow, um, that's the payload that we're going to use. Um, I just kind of simulated it so that I could kind of show you underneath the hood what's going on um, because uh, some of, number one, some of this stuff uh, is exposed to you when you run the exploit. And it's also, I find, very valuable to know what components are responsible uh, for what parts of the attack because most of the malware that you're going to run into isn't something that was put together with one big tool, right? So like even in this case, Metasploit, <clears throat> I may use Metasploit for one part of this, and then I'm going to use, um, you know, this code right here. So like this GitHub repo up here, I'm gonna use this for a different part of the attack. Uh, neither one of those are the back door. Then there's the third piece of code, which is the, um, the back door that we've been playing with um, that's a third part of the attack. So one, two, three, three tools to basically put together uh, one attack. And that's, you know, that's not necessarily the limit. So, um, you know, I just figured I would demonstrate that for everyone as well. Um, so you can kind of put together the dots of uh, which parts of the attack come from uh, which components. So, um, so I'm going to remove this for now because I don't need it. Uh, what I ended up doing, um, again, I wrote a bunch of documentation here about what's going on. Um, and then down here, you can actually um, git clone that repo if you want, um, if you want to follow along. Um, I'll also say that this link right here and then this link right here um, <clears throat> are extremely helpful as well. So you can see this was released in December 2012. Um, so, um, and if I remember, this is the um, this is the article put together by the guy who discovered this vulnerability in Acrobat Reader, uh, and then he proceeded to generate the exploit generator and all that stuff, so that it was helpful in providing code that Adobe could use to try to fix this bug. And it was a very kind of esoteric uh, bug. You can see that it's buried deep inside of the uh, bitmap um, uh, rendering code. <clears throat> so, and then he's got an even longer, um, he's got an even longer uh, white paper report um, that basically goes into detail about what's wrong, uh, what he had to put together so you can see this right here is kind of one of the key pieces <clears throat> where he's basically like using the image tags to to provide an image inside of the, uh, in this case, the XML code, um, which then gets accessed by the uh, JavaScript, and I'll uh, go into that later. And he pulls out uh, some of the code that, you know, Basically, this is pseudocode of the, it's derived from his analysis of Adobe's software. So you kind of analyze the disassembly, or probably analyze some of the C code that was generated by a tool like Ida Pro, um, because this obviously would have been before Ghidra, um, to try and give an idea of what was being done wrong, uh, so that it could help Adobe find out what they should do right uh, with that particular piece of code. So those are both really helpful reading um, that kind of give you some insight into how uh, some of this, uh, some of these attacks can uh, can break the uh, the reader. <clears throat> so I've already pulled this down uh, here, and um, the way that this exploit, the way that this uh, tool works is go here. Well, I'll just do this. So we can do a help. Um, so the way that this works is you can give it a, uh, a binary payload. So that one that I generated that made the payload.bin, um, if I wanted to go and manually write assembly language and then, you know, assemble that into machine language, 
Um, I could do that, have a binary file, and then I could pass it to this tool, and it would eject it right in. Um, it also has the ability to um, to ex uh, exploit um, uh, Metasploit, or not exploit, to, ex uh, to run the, in, in our case, the MSF Venom tool, um, and, uh, and create a custom payload using uh, MSF Venom, so using that kind of raw output um, uh, feature that I just demonstrated, um, which means that uh, the author wanted to make this so that it was something that was easily accessible uh, to anyone who already had a Metasploit kind of workflow put together. So that's what we'll use uh, for this. So I basically have it right here. <clears throat> and so the way that this works, um, because this is an older Python module, so the author wrote this in 2012, um, <clears throat> they wrote it before Python 3 had come around, so there's a lot of syntax in it that's only compatible with the old version of Python. Uh, which is one of the reasons I have both versions on the Kali VM for you. And then what I do is I added MSF payload, and then you may recognize some of this um, because I had it earlier. Uh, what it basically does is uh, takes um, kind of the end, like 75%, like three quarters of the command line that I showed earlier. So it assumes that it, you're running MSF Venom. It assumes that you're going to pass it um, dash f raw to tell it to output a raw file instead of um, instead of some other type of file, uh, and then it assumes that the next argument in the list is going to be the uh, the name of the payload. So in this case, the one that I searched for on Google, uh, and the one that I built the last um, executable with. Uh, so the other thing that we're doing here, um, and this is where we kind of get into um, the payload. Um, I'll actually do this for you all. So I'm going to do MSF console. <clears throat> and so what's nice um, about uh, Metasploit is they have this, you know, they have this nice help that I demoed earlier. So if I do info space uh, and then the payload name, It'll go and give me an explanation of what each one of the parameters are that I can that I can give it. So the exe is right here. So by default, it uses this uh, exe name. Um, has an exit func, which is a exit technique, um, which I, I'm not going to get into um, right now. But we typically use this one just because it happens to be the default. Um, and then a URL. So basically. Um, the URL is going to be uh, where the file is that's hosted. So <clears throat> the example that we used up here, and it's something we'll carry it down, is I'm actually just going to host it at this made-up domain name. Um, and I'm actually hosting it as a, as a PNG file. So even though we're going to have the exploit download an exe file, um, you don't uh, I, I, will, I will say that there is no um, authority that forces file type extensions and file type content to match on the internet. Um, so you can name anything on the internet that you want. It's kind of like that old um, adage, uh, don't trust anything on the internet. So, <clears throat> um, so basically I'm going to make it look like the program is downloading a uh, PNG file which is the type of behavior that you would not necessarily think is out of the ordinary uh, for Acrobat Reader. Whereas if Acrobat Reader were downloading something that ended in .exe, that might actually be more suspicious. So that's kind of the, uh, the thought process there. Um, it's going to write it to disk as this name, and then it's going to run it. So we're still going to have it writing an .exe file to disk, and we're going to have it run it. Um, but it's going to download from something like this. <clears throat> so I'm going to run it, and I'm going to output it into a file called attack.pdf. 
And so now you can see the output, um, just like I showed you before, um, the output of um, running MSF Venom, or I should say of the Python program running MSF Venom in the background, um, gets dumped out to the screen. Um, you don't see any evidence of errors here, so then we can look at the attack.pdf, and the attack.pdf is right there, and it looks good. Um, one of the neat things about it is that it's only about 9.5K, and, and um, for those of you who don't know, since it's a PDF, um, it's a combination of uh, plain text and uh, binary data. Uh, so in this case, this is a stream of compressed data here, and it tells it right here what filters to use to process the data. Uh, so Acrobat can have the data encoded in uh, any number of ways, and that's, uh, that's reflected here in the PDF. Uh, so then there's some other structural information, some stuff that you can analyze um, by, ha by hand or by eye a little bit, um, just to look at it. So I'm not going to get into those aspects of it uh, too much during this lecture, uh, but we'll get into some of the tools that exist to break apart the different objects within the, uh, um, within the PDF <clears throat> and analyze them individually later on. So but now we have a PDF that's, um, that's ready to be sent uh, to targets. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do um, is I'm going to bring up the Windows VM uh, so that I have a uh, demonstration target. All right. So this will be my Windows VM. Um, and you can see here, um, I've still got the adapter set to the host-only adapter uh, like we did earlier. Uh, <clears throat> however, a couple things that I'm going to change here. Uh, in uh, one of the previous lectures, I demonstrated how to, um, how to set the default gateway. Uh, to be uh, pointed at your uh, your Kali VM. In this particular example, we're going to go one step further, and um, I'm going to go and modify the configuration here. I may have already done it on here. Oh no, I haven't. So um, this will be helpful. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to go and get the IP address of this again. So it's 104. I don't know if that'll fit the copy buffer. Yeah. So so what I'm going to do is in addition to setting the default gateway to be my Kali VM, I'm also going to set the DNS server as my Kali VM. Um, so this way, when we use a tool later on that's called iNetSim, uh, we'll be able to simulate a lot of the DNS lookups in addition to um, all of the network requests that it's going to attempt to do. So I also have to set the gateway. So as I showed you earlier, I kind of reset this all the way back to start. So I need to go and redo uh, this step, uh, which we had done earlier on in the class. This way, uh, all of the network traffic will get routed through the, uh, the Kali Linux VM. And then sometimes you might get prompted for this. Um, I usually end up picking the most trusted network because I want to simulate the environment where um, the malware is most likely to perform the bad actions that I want it to do because my goal is to try and figure out um, what would the malware try to do if it were dropped onto a machine um, that's unprotected, right, or that's weakly protected. Um, so the machine can be weakly protected by not having defensive software on it, 
Um, but likewise, the machine can be weakly detected by having users that have a habit of doing this every time this dialog box comes up. <coughs> um, <coughs> the other thing um, that I'm going to do here, um, this is where um, using the shared folder comes in handy, um, or nap mode comes in handy. Uh, where was it? I linked in here the Acrobat reader right here. So there's a URL for this. You can wget it if you want, <clears throat> and then uh, and pull it down. So looks like it'll take like a few minutes or so. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, that'll download. Um, what we will do is we'll look at um, Acrobat Reader as I've got it installed here. So um, one of the other uh, features that Acrobat Reader has, I'm going to accept that, um, is that if I go in here into preferences, and this is a new feature that was introduced with Acrobat Reader 10, is that if I go to general, then down here, check. yeah, down here, it's got a nice uh, enable protected mode at startup checkbox. Um, so they introduced this concept of protected mode in, um, in Acrobat Reader 10. Um, <clears throat> this person's exploit um, actually halfway defeats it uh, for the purpose of the attack we're trying to do. Um, you can actually pair it with another exploit that the person found. Um, which is kind of a, a really long series of building, bo uh, building blocks um, that I'm not going to all clump together for this lecture. Um, <clears throat> but um, using the exploit's ability to bypass this halfway um, plus the other exploit that the person has put together, um, you can actually get the Acrobat Reader to be exploited uh, without having to uncheck the protected mode box. So, but um, because again, um, I'll just say that a large amount of the attacks that that I see, and that a lot of people, um, you know, that are that are thrown out there, and a lot of people defend against, um, often are assuming that users have um, disabled features like this, which is actually not that uncommon in a lot of enterprise environments uh, where there's a heavy use of um, say, uh, commercial activity being going back and forth with uh, PDFs that have, um, you know, high end or highly complex form elements in them and things like that. <clears throat> so it's not that uncommon uh, for features like this to be turned off. So um, again, for the purposes of trying to deal with analyzing uh, simplified exploits and not trying to unwind really uh, crazy things like the um, disassembly I showed you earlier, I'm going to turn that off. Um, I also have it highlighted here, so all the way at the bottom of the page, um, <clears throat> in case you want to come back to it later. And then we have to close it and then restart it, and that'll turn off the uh, protected feature. So. So you can see this is downloaded. Um, if you want, uh, you can go ahead and install it on your VMs um, if you uh, if you have a chance, um, and then also follow the short instructions here to basically turn that feature off. Um, what I'm going to do really quick is I'm actually going to jump over to, let me see, uh, I'm going to jump over to the uh, 
GitHub repository for this thing, um, just to show kind of one more thing. So, um, and this is more for uh, informational, um, but just it kind of steps in with the whole, um, these exploits are all put together from a series of, um, uh, what am I trying to say, a series of building blocks, right? So this person, in addition to this one, which this is the exploit that we're looking at, he also has this exploit down here. Um, this exploit down here doesn't have a lot of ex explanation down there. <clears throat> but um, basically this is a um, this is a DLL exploit that he has set up so that he can package he can package it into the other exploit that we were looking at, um, and he can get around the sandboxing that's built into Acrobat Reader. So if I take this thing um, and then also bundle this with the shell code I'm trying to execute, so basically add another stage, <clears throat> then I can uh, have a much more complex attack uh, that tries to bypass that um, protected mode feature. So. Kind of in a nutshell, showing you that the stuff is there. Uh, if you would like to try that on your own, um, I'm not going to dive into that for this week's lecture just because it's an added layer of complexity that could probably stand to have its own dedicated um, conversation. And I don't even know if I want to dive into uh, to that particular topic right um, uh, this uh, this semester. So, so anyway. You can see Acrobat Reader still continues to work uh, and everything like that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my, I'm going to go over here. Uh, and I've actually been, I was running this in the background before. Um, but I have this uh, INET SIN tool. Um, And so what INET SIM is, is basically an internet services simulation suite. So I can go here to features, and um, and this is all linked um, in, the doc in the earlier documentation. Um, it's over here somewhere. I think I have it linked all the way at the top. There we go. So what it has the ability to do is it is one program that allows you to, or that will listen on all of these services. So it'll have a fake server that implements the protocol for every single one of these things. So that if you have a, um, if you have a piece of malware, um, or in some cases if you have like a honeypot um, that you happen to be throwing if you have a honeypot that you happen to be throwing stuff into, um, then this can uh, basically be used to kind of confuse the attacker and then also collect a log of the activity that the attacker is doing. Um, this is a very powerful tool. Um, it's not the only tool like this out there, so definitely uh, you can find some other tools out there that kind of do similar things. Um, but I like this one because it's very easy to run as a standalone program. Um, and so if you remember earlier on in class, we were using Netcat to try to uh, interact with the malware. Um, this tool allows you to uh, simulate um, actions that are really difficult to do over Netcat, like downloading files and stuff like that. <clears throat> so um, in your Kali VM, <clears throat> there's a inetsim.com. And that's over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to show you the differences between it and the one that I did for this exercise. Um, and you can feel free to open it. You can jump to the lines. Um, but by default, it comes with a bunch of uh, pre-configured settings, uh, some of which don't really make a lot of sense. Uh, for our experiment, and that's because it's uh, designed to kind of run a different, uh, different environment. Um, but for example, 
Um, by default, it has a, um, it just listens on localhost. Um, you know, um, so I changed it so it's listening on the network interface, um, the default network interface. Um, the other thing that I can tell it is I can tell it that um, the default IP address that I want it to give out whenever a DNS lookup is made. So one of the services that it fakes is a DNS server. Uh, so if I don't want to have to manually configure a DNS server, I can use this to uh, set it up. Um, and then I can have it tell every single, or I can have it tell um, every single system asking for a name lookup that um, that IP address, my I, my Kali Linux IP address is the, um, you know, is the, is the host name for that or the IP address for that. Um, and then you can put in uh, default domain names and stuff like that. So um, if you want it, um, I should say if uh, the domain name of the server is often the response to a certain command, um, as is the case with like uh, mail, for instance, SMTP, um, SMTP, a common, um, a common part of the protocol is to ask for the server's name. Uh, you can actually have um, that stuff changed to any name you want. So for instance, if you're trying to pretend that the server is a, you know, is Microsoft.com or something like that to whatever is talking to it, um, you can configure that in this file. So it's a really long configuration file and I'm not gonna go through all the different um, configuration options in there. But um, I will say that um, if you go through the feature section here, um, there's multiple options for each one of these features. Uh, and if you're familiar with any of these services, um, you probably have some ideas of uh, what some of the options there that might be useful. <clears throat> so I can either run with the default inet sim configuration that's um, you know that I showed you up here, um, or I can give it a configuration file that's the modifications that I just showed you up here, and that's what I'm going to do. And again, those modifications are mainly to configure it so that it listens. Uh, all services are listening on the, you know, this IP address here. And that whenever the fake DNS service is asked for a DNS name, it always gets back the same IP address as well. The goal being that um, I want to convince the Windows machine to assume that every single website that it's going to reach out to um, is actually my Kali Linux VM. So uh, kind of trying to do a similar approach to what we were doing with uh, Netcat and with IP tables before. Um, but in this case, we're going to do it with uh, actually faking the network protocols. So now I'm running it. Um, and this tool should be installed on all of your Kali Linux VMs as well. Uh, so you shouldn't need anything uh, else to install. I, um, I'm 99% sure I got it installed on uh, the one, the version of the image I gave you. <clears throat> so I've got that set up. And so finally, the next thing I'm going to do is, um, if you remember, I compiled Oh, where did I do it? Yeah, I made the um, I made this right here. So I made the attack.pdf. Um, I'll just run it again. Oh. Sorry, I'll just run it right here. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to build the PDF again, just because I want to make sure that that I got the right version that I actually built in class today, and not some old one that I had from before. Um, so I know I've talked about this before, 
Um, a lot of times I'll use, I'll just bring it up again. Um, a lot of times I'll use the shared folders to try and move stuff back and forth. Um, did I have a question back there? Oh, okay. No worries. <laughs> just don't want to steamroll anyone. So um, I use the shared folders to move files back and forth um, in Linux. It's um, really easy to use the VBox SF um, driver. Um, and again, that's built into the image that I, uh, that I gave to you all. Um, so I have it mounted here. So I'm going to copy my attack.pdf to there. Um, I actually don't use the same shared folder between my Kali VM and my Windows VM um, for no other reason that, than just that I just don't have the two of them configured that way to use the same folder. Uh, so on the Windows VM, I actually have a different folder that I use. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy it to that folder. <clears throat> but again, if you wanted to simulate you know, emailing via Gmail or something like that, the attachment, uh, you can do that too. Um, although I'm not certain how successful emailing this via Gmail these days will work just because it can probably detect to this exploit. Um, but there's a lot of other tools out there to try and simulate the same thing. So here we can see the attack. Um, it says 1.59, but that's because this thinks it's 2 p.m. because it doesn't realize that we're in Eastern time. So some of you identified this um, during, or identified that little uh, configuration during the uh, um, forensic exercise as well. So I'm going to take this and I put it over here. And then um, one more thing I'm going to do is um, I often find, well, um, I often find that like Wireshark's really helpful in um, in trying to display the uh, network traffic. So I'll bring it up again. Um, and so I'll say. So I'll kind of narrow it down um, using the uh, IP dot adder equals equals the dot 108 IP address of my Windows VM. So uh, this IP address here. And then what I'll do is I'll run this. Um, and another key thing that I will point out um, is that the success rate of these exploits and most exploits you'll find as you continue doing malware analysis is not 100%. Um, although this one looks like it worked, hopefully. <clears throat> yeah, it did. So, is anyone able to point out something here that might look familiar to them in context of some of the other um, work that we did in class? Some of the other assignments, yeah? The destination IP, uh, the yep, that's right. So the IP address that has been embedded in that revolution backdoor all this time, um, and also the port number 444 um, is showing up in here, um, which is giving confidence that I was able to successfully deliver um, a copy of that backdoor to the exploit uh, when it ran. So you didn't see me stage the uh, attack yet. Um, and so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to walk through in Wireshark uh, what Wireshark saw happen. Um, and then we'll walk back uh, where I put stuff and where I, because, because it's actually really um, easy to stage this type of stuff in uh, iNetSim. So the first thing that happened was the um, <clears throat> the Windows machine 
because I configured the DNS server to be .104, the Windows machine did the lookup for that domain.mals, and I'm going to see if, I don't know if I can, uh, yeah, there we go. So, let's see if uh, this hopefully doesn't kill anything. There we go. So that's a little bit more readable. So the first thing it did was it got the, it asked for the domain that I hard coded using the, um, you know, using the, uh, what you call it, using this, right? So it saw that it looked that up. And then I got a response back telling it um, right here that, and this is the nice thing about Wireshark is it allows you to visualize all this. Basically responded back and said that, okay, for that domain, the IP address is here. So that piece is contributed by iNetSim. And then what happened is that the Windows machine connects to my machine on port 80, which is your normal HTTP port, so it's opening up a web connection. And then once it's established, it's sent to this get request right here. And then also, and this might give some insight into what aspect of the, um, uh, what aspect of Windows is actually in play here, it set the user agent string to be WinINet. Uh, so if you remember, um, during some of the Revolution Backdoor examples, in order for the FTP code to work mm -hmm. in Revolution Backdoor, we had to link it with the WinINet DLL. Or if you looked at the source code at the top, there was the WinINet.h was included. Um, so we're using the same code here um, to basically do the fetch. So this is Adobe Acrobat Reader is already taking the shell code that we built earlier to basically ask for this file. And you can see that it gets that, it wants to get that file, and this further breaks it down um, by all the different parameters. And then I'm just gonna see if I can do this. Yeah. And so then, what ends up happening is it gets a response. This thing doesn't parse the response. Or does it? It might parse it up here. Uh, no, it doesn't. But, oh well. You get to see all the headers and everything. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there we go. So anyway, what ends up happening is it gets the response and the response data is sent. Um, it's actually, because it's a large file, it's broken up into multiple packets. So you see them bounce back and forth here. Um, and then eventually uh, it has some other random stuff happen. Um, but eventually you get to a point where it's complete. And up, oh, here we go. It actually broke it down here. So this piece right here actually includes all the stuff above it. So this is the response where it's, you know, sending back. It actually tells it that the content type is image PNG. The content length is 99 kilobytes. Um, and then the server is iNetSim HTTP server. So it even announces itself. So these are, of course, all things that we can probably configure if we wanted to, um, so that we could make this be a little bit more um, stealthy uh, to the malware. So, but then eventually you get to where the client, um, the Windows machine starts trying to reach out, right? And, uh, and there we go. <clears throat> so then on the Windows machine, I can actually load up Task Manager As uh, some of you 
um, had mentioned in your um, uh, lab reports during the uh, forensics example as well. Um, it's a very useful tool. Um, if you're in Windows 10, you, I think, have to run it in administrator mode to see all this stuff. But it's pretty quick for us to see, say, that file name that we gave when we put together that Python command line uh, when we ran the, the, um, the MSF Venom tool is uh, available here as well. So we can see that it's still running on the system. So I can actually end it if I want to. Um, so it did get on the system, um, but we don't know where. Um, <clears throat> I will say that um, in this particular case, it actually writes it in the same location as the file that you opened. Um, but it, um, and I'll go, I'll have to do this here, but you don't get to see it by default because of this, the hidden files and folders. So if I show hidden files, and you can see it down here, which is just a, um, and the change I made applies to all folders, I think. Um, but uh, which is just a convenient thing to keep in mind um, for your own labs um, when you're putting them together is that it might be helpful to have this here or to enable that feature um, because that is something that um, some tools will take advantage of. It's just the fact that Windows has this conceal sensitive files from the user feature to it. Uh, so basically, when this got installed and written to disk, the exploit also set the file permissions to make this hidden, which is very easy right here. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that really quick. And then I'm going to I'm just going to clear the buffer out. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the way that INET SIM works is that uh, you can actually populate a number of uh, example files in this folder here. So in like slash bar, slash lib, slash INET SIM. Um, if you run, uh, I, I do believe INET SIM does run in Windows. I cannot remember exactly where it stores this stuff in Windows. Um, I do believe that this is a directory that's configurable. Um, I can probably, um, I don't know where it is though, but yeah. So basically we're in here and <clears throat> the nice thing about this is that they carve all the different um, file serving features, so all the different example file serving features into each one of the protocols. So if I want to host different PNGs when the user tries to download something via FTP, I can actually put it in here. Um, you know, I can put uh, an uploads folder and an FTP root folder so that I can keep track of any of the files that the user uploads using FTP. Um, so those of you who may have looked at the Revolution Backdoor example a little bit more closely might have noticed that there's a large section of the program that has uh, FTP commands in it. And those FTP commands are used for sending things like screenshots of the user's desktop back to the, um, back to the, uh, to the actor, uh, right? Um, so using this tool, you know, hypothetically be able to simulate um, the FTP uh, interaction feature that's in uh, Revolution Backdoor and experiment with that in addition to the command line stuff that we've been playing with. And then for our HTTP example, it's got a number of things. So um, it's got a www, www root, which is right here. And that www root um, allows you to serve an entire web directory that you can structure any way you want. So if you want to like um, host a WordPress site on there or something, or like a static site or something like that, you could. Um, 
It also has a post data um, area. And the post data area, you can see, already has some stuff. And so I can open up one of these. Um, <clears throat> it would be difficult to make heads or tails of it, but in a nutshell, what's going on here is um, any software that's making an HTTP post request, um, those post requests will be, saved, will be captured and saved to disk. So if I have malware that may, uh, maybe I can interact with it, but it's posting all of my, or everything that it sees um, to a folder somewhere, I can actually capture that side of the behavior and it's archiving it for me. So automatically it's archiving it for me. Um, but then the feature I'm using here is this uh, fake files. <clears throat> and the uh, fake files um, allows me to have uh, an example um, file for a bunch of different extensions. So this is set up so that um, if anyone tries to get any kind of GIF file, it will always return whatever the contents are of this sample.gif. Um, ditto for the sample.png. And as you can see, this one actually has a relatively new timestamp. Um, and that's because this is the um, this is the file that I served it. So um, if I was to just do a hex dump sample.png, <clears throat> well, let me do the view that you are going to be more familiar with. <clears throat> you can see that instead of this being a PNG, it's actually a Microsoft executable file. Um, I can also just run the file command on all these. And you can see that this one is a PNG file, but then sample.png is a Microsoft Windows executable. This is a JPEG, etc. So again, you don't need to, um, the file names don't actually have to match the file contents as far as like file type testing goes. Um, and then finally, for this particular example, yeah, so then there's, um, and there's MIME types as well, um, <clears throat> so that it uses this, and you can extend this as you see fit uh, to try to map uh, different, you know, MIME types um, that the uh, web application may respond with. So, um, what we might be able to do now is I would still have to do the IP tables command. Let me see if I actually have it in my history buffer. I don't. Um, oh, but I still actually have it uh, set up here. So um, what I can do is I can still run that. And I still have this simulation running. So maybe what we can do. So we can try and open this again. You'll actually probably get to see the file written because I didn't turn off that show hidden files feature. Um, so hopefully you'll actually get to see the file um, get written to disk and pop up. Um, and then with any luck, um, this other component will work too. Yeah, so there it is. It's Set the disk. Oh, I know what I screwed up. I'll just do this really quick. So my fault, I used the wrong port number. So we'll do this again. Um, third, second time's the charm. Hopefully this works. Let's see. Yep, so there we go. And so then, you know, maybe I can do Screenshot. I don't know if that'll work or not. Um,
Yeah, it's not going to work because I hard coded the IP address uh, and a different port in there um, for the FTP server. But you know, basically, you get the idea. Um, if I want to, um, I can. You know, and then it's crashing. So if I want to, um, I can basically, um, or I should say, uh, I can use this exploit to package up my backdoor that I've been working on all this time, uh, and I delivered it this way. 